It gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce Mercedes Pasquale, who's talking in today's seminar, which is sponsored. Uh, it's, it's both part of the ecolo uh, Ecology and Evolution Seminar Series, and it's also a major issues in modern biology uh, talk sponsored in part by the uh, Storer Endowment. And uh, Mercedes did her undergraduate work in Brazil and Argentina, got a master's degree in mathematics in New Mexico, a PhD from the joint program from MIT and Huey in 1995. And uh, after that, received a uh, uh, U.S. Department of Energy Alexander Hollander Distinguished Postdoctoral Fellowship for Studies at Princeton, and uh, then went on to a job at the uh, University of Michigan, where uh, there's something in between. Yeah, yeah, I skipped a little thing. We'd be here all day. Uh, but you are at the University of Michigan. Yes, I remember, in Ann Arbor, where she is currently the Rosemary Grant Collegiate Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. Uh, her work focuses uh, both on uh, now uh, a lot on uh, areas of uh, the interaction between epidemiology and ecology, and also on more general issues of theoretical ecology. She's a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator and uh, on the external faculty of the Santa Fe Institute, and in 2003 was named by Discover Magazine as one of the top 50 women in science. And I'm sure she will give us a great talk. The title is Climate Forcing and the Population Dynamics of Infectious Diseases in Changing Human Landscapes. Thank you, Alan, and thank you for the invitation. Um, it's, uh, it's great to be here. I have a microphone, but apparently it's not for the room. So I thought it would be better not to have two microphones. I hope if you cannot hear me, let me know. And uh, the other apology I have to make is that this title is only good for half of the talk because I, and, and therefore if you saw a summary of the talk, it's not exactly what I had planned. But I, I wanted to, to talk about climate, but I also wanted to talk about pathogen diversity. So I combined this. And, uh, if I had to give you a new title, it would be really the population dynamics of infectious diseases from an ecological perspective. And that perspective for me includes, in my work, the influence of the environment, both uh, climate variability and climate change, on the population dynamics of infectious diseases, but also more recently, uh, how we look at the influence of population dynamics on pathogen diversity and then how this uh, structure of diversity influences the back the dynamics. So you can think of this as ecological subjects in particular if you, if you consider that uh, in fact disease systems are very much consumer resource systems in which the consumer is the infected individual and the resource is the susceptible individual that has not built immunity. In fact, there are a lot of analogies there. And from the very early models of transmission dynamics, where you have the number of individuals, those that are susceptible, those that are infected, and those that are recover and immune, uh, we have known for a long time that as the number of infected increases, the resource, the number of susceptibles decreases below a threshold, at which point the population growth turns around and you cannot get another outbreak until you rebuild this resource. We more or less all know this. I apologize if you do. This causes a tendency to oscillate that then can be reinforced by seasonal transmission and also interact with seasonal transmission. This is an example from the very well-known case of measles, very well studied in modeling of diseases, where you see the cases uh, over time pre-vaccination and you get this period two, uh, small peak, large peak, typical of these uh, new periods that can arise from these interactions. And also the reason why it's difficult from these kinds of patterns to infer whether a particular driver is at play. So I've been interested for a long time in how can we use mathematical models for the population dynamics of infectious diseases to unravel the interplay of climate variability with these feedbacks within the disease system itself. And by those feedbacks, I really mean these processes that depend on the current or past state of the system, such as the levels of immunity in the population or the levels of control measures, as we will see. 
And of course, if you are an ecologist, you can think of this as the sort of density dependent or frequency dependent processes in the system and trying to uh, separate them from some underlying driver. Of course, there has been progress in this area. There, there is wonderful work now on modeling infectious diseases. I think that an area that remains a challenge is to consider uh, population dynamics in what we can call changing human landscapes, that is under non-stationary conditions. Uh, of course, climate change, but also socioeconomic development in large cities under land use change, the same conditions that allow control measures and also evolutionary change. So I'm interested in those topics, and in particular for diseases that lie in this gray interface here at the middle, uh, because we, of course, know very well how to model diseases that basically give you no immunity. Those are easy, they behave nicely, they go to some equilibrium. Those that uh, confer full immunity, the ones I just described, measles, childhood diseases, the perfect nonlinear oscillators, we know that paradigm, it does not apply to the many diseases that have these messy partial distributed levels of immunity that basically have to do with other things such as asymptomatic carriers, uh, the reinfection, superinfection, etc. And in particular, uh, this relates to malaria, a disease that you all also know quite well. It is a vector-borne infection with a complex life cycle, uh, shown here for Plasmodium falciparum, a sexual phase in the mosquito and a sexual one in humans. And uh, I will also talk about the second parasite, Plasmodium vivax, that uh, has a slightly different uh, cycle in which uh, essentially a resting state in the liver allowed it, allows it to relapse and generate infections uh, when the mosquito is not present. So if you are interested in climate, the places that we know should be most sensitive are those at the edge of the distribution of the disease because trivially it is here that climate variables determine the distribution, the extent of the distribution. So in those regions that are illustrated uh, here, for example, for Africa, we have desert fringes, the edge of deserts where rainfall is a limiting factor for the recruitment of the larvae, but also the highland regions where the decreasing temperatures uh, can, with altitude can limit the growth of the vector and the development of the parasite within the vector. In those regions, uh, you see dynamics of this kind illustrated here from, with two time series of cases from two tea plantations where you see the very epidemic behavior and this considerable variation in the size of epidemics from one year to the next. It is this uh, so-called interannual variation that we have been interested in for a long time in relation to climate. Of course, there are also the long-term trends that are the subject of debate. And I should say that uh, these regions are not only interested from the perspective of climate. I also believe that they are inter interesting locations if we are interested in what should we see when, we, when the disease approaches the uh, elimination boundary and therefore the low transmission uh, regimes. So with that in mind, my outline today will be um, basically to tell you about my studies of uh, desert malaria in India and to talk about climate forcing in the context of epidemiology. One of the questions we can ask, going back to what I just mentioned, is whether population immunity plays a role in these regions. And then I will move to higher spatial resolutions to ask whether a, region, a regional gradient in irrigation-based development basically modifies this coupling to climate. In the second part, this is a study, a more theoretical study, still on malaria but on diversity, on pathogen diversity. And the question is whether here the population can be considered to be structured into strains by population dynamics and how does this relate to persistence? And since this is theory, some future directions on how we may test these ideas. Now, we went to India for these questions on um, looking at the role of um, immunity and, and interaction with climate. And because of the long-term records, so this is one of the 
areas of uh, desert malaria where we have long-term records since uh, basically the 70s where the disease returned to the, well, re, uh, had a resurgence in, 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 the, in the Indian subcontinent. So the data is, uh, there is a surveillance system at the national level and we concentrated in Northwest India, here the states of Gujarat and Rajasthan, first at the level of sub-districts. And you will see some data first for this sub-district, the sub-district of Kutch, uh, which borders Pakistan. And uh, we will move later to higher spatial resolutions. So this is again how this, the dynamics look, very epidemic. And with, you see here the cases from 1987 monthly. These are confirmed cases in red. And you see the epidemics and of course, if you look at rainfall, not surprisingly, in these arid regions, you can see uh, by eye, of course, that following the monsoons, we get the epidemics. So this is the data again. If we plot the reported malaria cases versus the accumulated rainfall the previous six months, uh, not surprisingly, there is a relationship uh, with a threshold here above a certain threshold. However, we have significant variation, and so we wanted to see can we improve on uh, these types of correlation? So the questions again, I will ask whether population immunity plays a role even in these low transmission regions, and also how predictable is the size of outbreaks based on transmission models that are driven by climate. And this is just a sketch of the kinds of approach, approaches we have been using. We have an epidemiological system that is basically mostly hidden variables because all we measure is the observed cases, but we want to model the, the dynamics of cases as a function of climate forcing and to basically uh, see the contributions of these two components, the intrinsic dynamics and the extrinsic drivers. And because we are going to do this uh, using inference from time series data, and as I said, data with noise, uh, I'm going to use relatively simple models uh, that can address those questions. The first one here is the simplest possible one that does not, is not a very good one for malaria, but it's a starting point. We have susceptibles, those that are exposed to an infection bite, then the inf individuals that become infected, and then uh, that recover and can lose immunity in time. We consider that the force of infection, the rate at which susceptibles get the, the disease is proportional to those that are infected. And then the, we have a function of seasonality and also rain, a function with a threshold that we estimate uh, and, and also environmental noise. Now this, trans, this force of infection goes through these uh, con compartments here that represent in the simplest possible way the effect of the mosquito vector Basically, these compartments introduce a delay, a distributed delay between this uh, force of infection at time t and the future. Now, the, this model is too simple because malaria doesn't give full immunity. Sorry, uh, yes, so, so this model assumes full immunity. So one step, uh, one step uh, further is just to divide the infectious individuals into those that have symptom, sympt symptoms and those that are asymptomatic. And similar, you can be uh, susceptible but have had inf uh, the infection before, in which case if you get bitten again, you basically never uh, go to this class. You don't have symptoms, but you can contribute to transmission. So these two classes down here implement clinical immunity in the model in the sense of um, not of keeping the population away from symptomatic uh, disease. Now, a technical point, uh, uh, we fit these models by a, a model, by a method that was developed by our colleagues at Michigan, uh, Eda Ionides and Aaron King. And this, this essentially allows you to maximize the likelihood of a model, so you can co also compare different models based on uh, mole selection criteria. But what is interesting is this, uh, that if you can simulate these moles, you can feed them by a process where each simulation has a set of parameters that vary uh, randomly. And from step to step, you are actually uh, selecting 
those that have the highest likelihood and generating descendants that uh, have small changes in the parameters. So this process, this, uh, this is known as a particle system and this gets iterated not just in time but then also multiple times until you converge to some likelihood. It is a nice method as you will see later for some reasons that uh, will become obvious in, in a moment. So I just wanted to show you some of the results. As I said, we, asked, we have the likelihoods we can <laughs> Compare hypotheses, for example, the models with and without clinical immunity. And we find that the more complex model, that that includes cl clinical immunity, uh, is important here at seasonal scales. So primarily, um, as, as, uh, what the reason this model performs better is that it captures the, not the highs, but the lows better. And in doing so, it allows the response to climate to, to basically be more accurate. And so in the absence of clinical immunity, then the model tells you immunity is very, full immunity is very, is, is very short. And so, and this model also outperforms a standard non-mechanistic uh, model that includes rainfall. So this is just to show you a little bit, give you a sense for how well the model performs the cases are in red, the simulation, with, essentially this is a simulation, I should not, it's not, this is actually the median of many simulations and this is the uncertainty or the confidence intervals. But this is not the fit, this is the essentially simulating 30 years ahead and you can see that the model does pretty well. Now, if you actually try to um, look at prediction skill, but retrospectively, we can repeat this process, remove one year at a time, and predict it uh, from the end of the monsoon season, from the end of August, that's what the blue dots are, and then the decay is in, gr in green, the uncertainty, again, confidence intervals in, uh, in the light blue. And basically here, uh, we can also quantify in different ways retrospectively, how well this model would have been predict, would have predicted the past. The prediction skill compares this, this, uh, the accuracy of the model to that of the simplest prediction, which is basically saying each September is like your average September, October, etc. So are you doing better than the seasonal mean? So these models do well. And we can also use this to ask, what about vivax? I told you before that uh, we also have um, the second species, and I, and I will use this second species to talk about ev evaluating prediction, obviously, in the future and not in the past, since uh, that is more difficult. But we have, again, a model in which we can add a set of compartments that are now these compartments H, which are just this stage in the liver, from which you can get relapses and have infections. So this, this is a, an interesting reservoir for the dynamics. And because we have very separate seasons, we can plot the relapse cases versus the transmission cases. And you see that you have this cloud, not very nice. But if you separate the, the, basically the years that correspond to very low rainfall, this is rainfall below a threshold, you have a high correlation between the relapses and transmission. So there is this interesting interaction where you, if you uh, consider the, the relapses, this res reservoir is particularly important when rains fail and less important when rain, rains are there. What the model allows you to do is to capture that in a nice, in a nice uh, mechanistic way. And I wanted to make, uh, to basically use this model, this is Vivax for the same district and these are predictions going forward uh, each year from the, so we fitted this model up to 2006 and you can say, well, uh, in, in public health, in diseases, of course, the system is always under some, uh, fortunately for diseases, but not for us. By the time you fit them all, the conditions are changing because there are all sorts of interventions. So what we are doing here is essentially by the end of the monsoon system, uh, using this uh, particle filter to 
give them all one more year of data and estimate the new initial conditions. So we can do these predictions in this adaptive manner. And this is very nice because we can get these hidden variables that we are estimating updated, and you see that we do much better than if we don't. So, so this is an, all this is very nice, but we have a very short lead time between the effect of rain and the epidemics. So this led us to consider the relationship with climate more globally than just the, the regional rains. And we did this by uh, following up on something we had done with cholera before, which is exploratory. Basically, you take the disease over here and uh, at its peak, for example, October, and for every year, you correlate it with sea surface temperature. So we are taking a time series of sea surface temperature in a, the global ocean in each point of a, of a grid. And then we have these rank correlations. Uh, and the dotted line show the places where these are significant at the 95% level. And you see, we were looking for something in the Pacific here to uh, look at uh, essentially perhaps an effect of the El Nino on this part, on, on rainfall in this part of the world. But we were surprised to find that the tropical South Atlantic showed this negative correlation. So cooler temperatures were followed by more disease. This gave us a somewhat longer lead time, not particularly long, but longer. Uh, but this is correlation and not necessarily uh, a physical link. So uh, climate models with uh, co preset conditions in this part of the ocean showed that what changed, at least in the models, was precipitation in this part of the world. So that at least there could be a physical connection that makes sense. So we use this for for our uh, early warnings. And then all of this was very nice until we looked at other places. So that, that's always something bad to do. You, and I apologize for using Google, but this gets the point across. We were in these uh, nice districts that are very arid. And I showed you those results. They are very nice. But then the rest of the world over there looks like this. It's under ex uh, very extreme land use change, lots of agriculture and irrigation. And um, this is, again, uh, correlation maps, as I showed before with SST, but now with a variable that is just uh, from remote sensing, uh, the basically known as NDVI, which is vegetation on the ground. So it's just another surrogate for rainfall. But I want to make the point that along this irrigation gradient, this areas of significant correlation in, in red disappear. And so you can say, is this because the risk is no longer there? Or is this because they are better at controlling the disease in those places where presumably they have more resources? So the second is, is true. And, and to make a long story short, I have here the, in red again, the cases of falciparum for one of those districts where you see the epidemics. And then in blue, I have plotted this uh, introduced control. This is uh, the population covered by insecticide spraying. And you can see these cycles. And then these epidemics, when the control relaxes, you get, and you have rains, these surprises arise. So, these cycles are not very surprising if you consider that the population cover is related to the cases in the previous two years. This is by policy in these places to plan how to control the disease. It could also emerge from just human behavior and the limited resources. But this, of course, this and not immunity has here the strong, uh, the strong um, possibility of generating cycles and surprises. And a student of mine uh, showed this with a model, but he also showed that this reactive control policy uh, is less effective than one based on rainfall. And in fact, it can uh, preclude you from getting to the elimination point. And this is shown here with a model that is like the one I showed you before, but now has a more uh, detailed description of the vector with the larvae, uh, and then the adults that are uninfected, exposed, and infectious. The point of this model uh, 
was that if we drive it with different uh, samples of 10 years of rainfall in the region and then look at the total cases versus two ways of controlling. So you may control as a function of rain or you may control as a function of previous cases as they do. The previous cases is the red and the green is what you get for total cases versus total control for the rainfall. What is interesting here is that for similar control efforts over 10 years, you basically see that this way of doing things never gets you to elimination because you get stuck into these dynamics with these surprising epidemics. Now, to um, go to the higher scales, we wanted to look at, this, uh, at the effect of irrigation and associated development over time in terms of its effect on malaria. This is well known from the literature. We know that irrigation can increase mosquito habitat. And, it, and we also know that uh, it can improve socioeconomic conditions leading to elimination as it has done in the Punjab, for example, which now is, of course, a very important agricultural region in India. But what hasn't been done is to follow these two effects over time. And we wanted to do this by basically taking advantage of a spatial gradient as a surrogate for uh, essentially the timing of the arrival and duration of irrigation. So we did this by looking at this, uh, at this more, this is again catch and two other districts, but broken into sub-districts. And we have here the confirmed cases at that level from 1997, but also the levels of control. And this uh, slide summarizes, oh, this is very strange. Sorry, this is an important story in the, an important slide, but for some reason, it's very weird. Okay, okay let me then, uh, I have to skip this and, and tell you, the slide is here, uh, some reason, for some reason it's not projecting. So, so let me tell you what we, what we found. We basically found that these, these sub-districts uh, can be clustered. If you just take the space-time dynamics with an algorithm to look for districts that have similar dynamics, we can cluster them into two regions that are basically the most arid ones and the ones that have been irrigated for a long time. So we knew the, the, about irrigation from remote sensing in one year in 2009. And then from there, we created a classification that allowed us to create a time series of irrigation from basically the vegetation index in the season when there is no rainfall. We created that time series and we asked, where, where has irrigation changed the most? It has changed the most in between these two regions in, a, in an area that basically has seen the arrival of a canal, but is officially not yet connected. From remote sensing, you see people are using it. If you ask where is malaria, in, where has malaria increased the most in that, in that uh, whole um, area, you'll see that it is in this place where you have seen the strongest change in irrigation. And if you ask where has control been the highest, it has also been the highest there. So it's not that you have lots of cases because you don't have control. It's the opposite. You have lots of control, but it's not working in this transition region. So to summarize, we have three distinct regi regimes. The basically, um, here you can see the low. These are the regions with low risk and low control. They have been irrigated for more than 30 years. The, High risk and low control, those are the ones we can predict very well based on climate. And then you have these interesting ones that are the high risk but high control. 
that have been stuck in that state for 10 years, over 10 years. So the main, main point we are making with that is that this transition, at least in this case study, has taken more than a decade. And it's still in progress. Of course, we would like to make it from here to here faster and understand those transitions better. So i like now to talk about um, the second part. This is, this is shorter. But basically, uh, to transition to diversity, ask the question of whether we fully understand the behavior of these malaria moles under uh, basically changing conditions. And this basic question is whether we would see a continuous or discontinuous response in the dynamics as we change transmission. So this is uh, what I call a continuous response. If we, have, we change the biting rate, for example, we go to equilibria that decrease monotonically. Alternatively, we, have, we can see these kinds of behaviors where we have coexisting equilibria. And which one you go to depends on where the system starts from. So you may come from here and then jump to have this uh, sudden change that has attracted attention in ecology under the name of tipping points. But for malaria models, uh, this type of behavior we have found in a model that has super infection, that is where you can get repeated infections by different strains. And in the literature, it has been also reported in models with reinfection, where you recover, but because Presumably, there are other strains you can get reinfected again and, and acquire immunity that way. But in the end, to understand better this kind of uh, issue, then we need to understand the strain diversity in these systems, which is just treated very phenomenologically in the models I just showed you. So the question we have been interested in is whether plasmodium falciparum populations are structured into strains uh, from the perspective of a major antigenic determinant. And this is uh, an interesting example of dynamics that uh, in this case is just, uh, I will talk about malaria, but similar questions have been asked about other systems in influenza, etc. So in this case, this is a protein that is encoded by a multi-copy gene family, and these uh, genes are found in different chromosomes of the pathogen. They are related to the function of basically uh, adherence to, to microvasculature. Uh, you can also, they relate to severity of disease, but for us what is important is that they relate to immune evasion. So this is a, a parasite inside, inside an infected red blood cell, well, at least my view of it. And uh, what this protein is shown in the surface of the, is in the surface of the red blood cell, so the immune system can see it. But interestingly, the pathogen is showing these different variants. This, it's basically uh, expressing this gene sequentially. So this results in chronic infection for a longer time. This is a strategy of the parasite to show its identity uh, sequentially. This is one, one parasite, but the whole population of parasites within one infection has these waves, and each of these waves is dominated by one of these types. So in, at some level, they are coordinating this sequential expression. Now, they also recombine very, strong, very much when they are in the mosquito. And the reason this is also fascinating is if you go to actual populations out there and you ask how many variants of these genes uh, are there, uh, there are 50 to 60 genes in one parasite, but the pool of possible variants in a local population is very, very high. Other parasites do this. In the case of malaria, this is the work from the work of our collaborators, in particular Karen Day at NYU. And if you look at the numbers of sequences sampled in a natural population versus how many types there are, this is like a cumulative diversity curve in ecology. 
you see that in low trans transmission regions, you have of the order of 100. In African regions with high endemicity, you can have in the order of thousands, and this has not yet uh, basically saturated. So you have a, presumably you have a pool, let's say, of, of the order of 1,000, and you have 50 of these, so you can sample 50 of these. The, at least the combinatorics is enormous, but you can ask whether competition for host mediated by immunity can structure the population into stable strains despite this high recombination between these, these, these genes. Now what we are asking here is whether the population dynamics really generate selection, frequency dependent selection, in a way that structures will create linkages between the genes. And this is, uh, this is important, I will show you, in terms of persistence. But, uh, well, uh, this light has also disappeared. So, we first wanted to show what happens in a model where we basically implemented oops, individuals and track the, his, each host and its history of infection. So in this model, let me skip to the next one, we have biting, biting rates between hosts. Each host acquires immunity only to the types it has seen. And so if many uh, hosts have seen a, a given type, then that type can go presumably extinct and be at, uh, at low levels. So, the, the strains will be defined as basically a repertoire of variants, and these repertoires can recombine when a mosquito bites a human that is infected by more than one variant. And there are also some rules for what happens with co-infection, but what matters here really is what happens at the population level. And at least for, for what I want to tell you. So the main, con main conclusion from the model is here. Uh, so what we see in this model where we are simulating, in this particular case, a case that is smaller than, than the real one, we have uh, basically six genes and pools of around 30 or 50. Uh, if you think about it, it could generate in terms of possible combinations in the order of 10 to the 7 different repertoires. Obviously, they are not all there, but we simulate this when all the genes are there, and what we see is that the, the population converges to basically the dominance of some types, and these dominants are all functionally equivalent. We are not assuming that there are any functional differences, but the competitive interactions structure the population into dominant types. The colors are just uh, the numbers of cases of each repertoire. And then the gray colors are those that are at very low, very low densities. So despite this very low, despite the diversity in the system, these, uh, these uh, other ones cannot invade and the ones that dominate are the ones whose repertoires do not overlap or overlap minimally. So this is, this is also the case as we include, we increase recombination rate, but what we see is these instabilities that reorganize the system and then we go back to some other combination of non-overlapping strains. If you don't like to think about parasites, you can think about these as traits, traits that determine competition and neutral competition in the sense that ecology think about uh, essentially uh, no other differences than just the frequencies in the population. So you can say, well, who cares about this from the perspective of epidemiology? I just told you that essentially we don't have a mix, uh, essentially at least in the mall, we don't have a, a mixing we don't have one pathogen, we have multiple strains, and these are emerging from the transmission dynamics through competition. Now, interestingly, if we increase bar diversity, this is the, the name, if we increase the number of the genes in the system that are, that are present in different ways, then we always see that at higher 
diversity, we get more stable coexistence, and at the low transmission uh, and also uh, low diversity, we see this uh, more epidemic behavior. So the, the, this slide may, tries to make the point that uh, this ha can have consequences for intervention so that when you intervene, it's not just how, do you how much you decrease the prevalence, but how do you change the, basically the diversity, the structure of the diversity. And what we are showing here is basically uh, a simulation where we take the system through a massive uh, treatment of the population. We take it to, to basically low prevalence very rapidly. Now, what happens at that point is that you go from these more, these coexisting repertoires to one in which you have this uh, more oscillatory epidemic behavior with replacements of one type by the other. So what has happened well, is that as you uh, decrease the diversity, the, the genetic diversity here is increasing more slowly than the recovery of the prevalence. So we, are, we can shift the system to a regime that basically is more oscillatory and more prone to extinction, which we claim we could take advantage of by other interventions. So these regimes, uh, oh, let me, yes, uh, this, this, uh, these regimes uh, that are found in other models of, of uh, uh, competing strains uh, are, are interesting, but is there evidence for them in the, in the field? And I have this, uh, what I call this initial test of the theory here, not to go through this in detail, but to make the point that these uh, data sets that we have in, in populations to actually look at VAR genes and to also uh, look at parts of the genome that are not under this type of selection, for example, the microsatellites, have very low number of isolates. I told you this is a very diverse system. With like 30 isolates, we may not really uh, be able to detect this. But what we, we did in this, uh, in this paper was to look at, in different ways, at the, at the structure in this, uh, of essentially associations between the genes in the repertoires, both for these genes that, that are important to competition, that are antigenic, and for the genes that are in the, in the neutral part of the genome in microsatellites. And I should say the main, uh, I will only mention this uh, result if we measure uh, a measure of relatedness, so the number of VAR types that are shares, shared between two isolates to actually look at, this, uh, at these um, associations. The patterns have no relationship to what we see uh, in the relatedness uh, in the more neutral parts of the genome, and there are networks of uh, uh, essentially uh, isolates, so individuals, that show very linked uh, VAR genes, and these networks are not reflected in the more neutral part of the genome. So, to, to summarize some of the theoretical results, the model predicts that despite high recombination, immune selection through this competition can structure the pathogen into distinct, uh, largely non-overlapping repertoires, and the model suggests that the dynamics of the system can be moved into a different regime, more prone to extinction by reducing the transmission rate. So, I said that preliminary analysis suggests the existence of these highly correlated VAR types that are not explained by high levels of underlying genome relatedness. To, for, for those interested in those topics of competition, this, this work relates back to uh, the study of this uh, in uh, deterministic models by Sunetra Gupta and colleagues, where she talked about basically uh, population segregating into these discrete strains. What has been added more recently is basically more explicit evolution and the, stochast the stochasticity of the dynamics. For example, uh, in the case of flu, by showing that uh, 
the rate of mutation was important in terms of which of these regimes you would get. So I'm pointing this out because what happens in the malaria system in terms of changing from one regime to the other is that as you reduce transmission, you are reducing recombination rate by reducing co-infections. So you are behaving in a similar way to what we see in influenza in this mutation limited regime where you have cycles. And so this is a more general behavior of competitive systems under evolution that should be relevant to a variety of pathogens. And that I think has analogies to uh, questions we are asking in community ecology at the level of species when we try to use, when we try to use phylogenies and traits distributed over phylogenies to ask whether there is evidence for competition or not or environmental um, <laughs> filtering, etc. But in the case of the pathogens, we can actually have data to test for signals of this competition. Now, I said the preliminary analyses are too shallow, so I wanted to point out in a terrible slide, again, I apologize, I think my computer uh, has a resolution that is too high for the projection. These were some uh, photos of a project that we have started in, in Africa to sample populations much more deeply in terms of the, the diversity of the pathogens and of these genes and to go through a major intervention over time to see what happens. And by, by uh, some, this is with current day, and to sample more deeply, I mean sampling every person, almost every person in these villages, for which you will have then not just the parasite diversity for this, uh, the sequences of these genes, but you will have the, 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 basically the location in space, the age, the season, and we will go through an intervention to see how diversity changes. Interestingly, from the pilot, these are, these are samples of non-clinical people. In these places, the number of infections, clinical infections, are the tip of the iceberg. Most of the population is in, in this non-clinical state I, I talked to you before in this reservoir of infection, basically 30 to 40% of the population has parasites in this non-clinical state. So, of course, it's not clear whether all of these are relevant, but I think that an interesting question moving forward in terms of understanding these hidden reservoirs of transmission in, the, in, in many diseases is, is essentially to connect malaria, sorry, epidemiology and genetic diversity. I don't think these models have to uh, be these uh, theoretical models with this level of detail, but I think we need a way to represent in a phenomenological way the effect of this diversity in a way that basically is consistent with what happens when we intervene in, uh, in systems where we actually um, consider diversity. So let me end by thanking the people who have done uh, most of the work, Yael RC for the work I just showed you, a postdoc of mine now at the University of Amsterdam, and Mary Rorick, also a postdoc in, in my lab, and also uh, Karina Lanei and Andres Baeza in particular for the work in India, um, and then some of the, well, another terrible picture, uh, you need a better projector. Uh, <laughs> my photo was, uh, was actually uh, in better colors, but uh, I had some of the funding sources. We don't care about those. Uh, let, me just, uh, let me just go back and, ask, and, and then end here for questions.
resource-based, also connected to ecology, but it isn't necessarily strain-dependent. Um, how do you think that kind of wrinkle uh, would play out in the antigenic dynamics? So, so you are referring to the within-host uh, behavior yeah, and competition of strains? I know they work on drug resistance, but also you mean competition within host. Like competition um, yeah. sort of yes, I, um, I think well, I think that uh, that raise, raises an interesting uh, question. At the popu at the population level here, we we are considering. So I I actually think that this. Uh, Within host, uh, the within host dynamics are important, but that they will not change these major conclusions. Um, although you know that remains to be seen. We did consider for the rules within the host. We basically had a set of rules rather than than dynamics, but a set of rules. We consider four or five set of rules, actually four, that in ca that basically capture uh, different assumptions about interactions within the host. And in all cases, we, we, would get, uh, we would get these structures emerging. So uh, I think that uh, the question that, we, that is more interesting in terms of those factors is uh, if uh, those are strains that differ in their fitness because uh, uh, so that differ in their fitness independently from their frequency, then there is a question, for example, if, uh, if they cause different severity or they have different transmissibilities, then um, these kinds of repertoires, how should they be organized? Should you have strains that are uh, all, all severe or all transmissible? Should you have a combination of both? There are all sorts of interesting questions about further structure that would sort of take these two axes that Peter Chesson talks about, which are the 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 sort of more functional differences in the fitness and these frequencies here. So we started doing some of that work. The, the con conclusion that the structuring remains is there, but what is interesting is, is uh, more of, uh, as I said, should you have like a mixed strategy of, of uh, a combination of, uh, of uh, transmissibility, severity, or should you just uh, uh, be better off being the most, uh, having the best, in a sense, all of the best, the, the genes that are also associated with, with uh, the, the highest fitness. So, so there are a lot of questions to, to ask here. Uh, there, are also, there are also issues about the genetics of the host and, and other. I, I don't necessarily think that when we look at the data, we will, uh, whether we will find evidence confirming this, uh, this uh, theoretical hypothesis is one question, but I think it will be fascinating to, act, to just describe uh, what we see and what we see through a major intervention, because that, that hasn't been done, and, uh, and we could even question whether under recombination it, make, it makes sense to think about strains within these species. And, and so I know that... Uh, uh, we, will, uh, we will have an answer to those questions, but whether, for example, we will see strong spatial effects that have more to do with uh, dispersal limitation and also stochasticity of these small populations, that will also be interesting. So. Yes? So, you, in the beginning, you talked a bit about various management approaches. Did you could you tell us a little bit more? Did you really try and do some sort of optimization of management based on the approaches, based on the, the model that incorporated these other factors, or did you? No, I mean, I, that's an interesting, uh, we had, so the question is whether we did some optimization of the, some work on uh, basically the management of the disease or the, of the control of the disease. Yeah. And, uh, no, I, I, I think that is something that will be uh, quite interesting uh, for these kinds of, uh, of models. And I think the reason it's also interesting is in terms of the, the cost and the feasibility of the different management, management strategies. The reason they do the planning they do uh, 
is, is because of uh, is essentially allocating resources for next season. Uh, if you were waiting to observe the climate, sorry, the climate, to observe the rain, the rain of the season, you would have much, a much shorter time. Uh, so there are, of course, other ways to, uh, at this, now these diseases, at least in this region, that are very seasonal and low transmission, they are really at the edge of persistence. So these are regions that have a chance of eliminating the disease. And it's very interesting to me that in places where it has happened, for example, with longer term development, at least in the study I showed you at the end, even if they have epidemics at the, at the edge of this region, we don't see the, uh, we don't see the reinvasion happening even in the absence of control. So obviously something, the system is in another state and there, there is an interesting paper uh, by David Smith talking about uh, essentially the resilience to, of those states, those elimination states. So there is, I think how you manage uh, these transitions will be really interesting and, and what are some of the constraints in terms of the, the cost and the timing. So it, it could be quite interesting. But we see some of these, uh, as I said, surprising events that are in the, in the record. We see some of these cycles. So there is this, I think this nonlinear feedback is really operating there um, at a basic level. Yes. Um, do you find that the transmission after the monsoon season is on par with the growth in, growth in actual mosquito population? Or have you observed other components in the malaria that are making it more robust and effective? I think in these systems it is clear, well, it's not my observation because our malls are at too, uh, too high a level to describe that we are not really considering that level of mechanism. We are also, um, as, ideally we would love to also have time series on the, on the mosquitoes. Uh, we only have that for urban malaria, but not these rural areas. And so, so we don't have that. But, but clearly from the knowledge of the people that have been there in the field for a long time, it is really an effect of rainfall on the, on the vector population. A more interesting question is what is it about the vectors? Once you made it to basically having low cases and almost no control, what is it about the system that has changed, either in the vectors, the ecology of the vectors, uh, or the environment of the, the susceptibility of humans? And, uh, and that, that is something that, uh, that uh, is very interesting, but uh, needs to be looked at. Let's uh, thank uh, Mercedes again.